Good evening from Miami. I'm Katie Fang in for Chris Hayes. We're now just 70 days out from Election Day, just 10 days away from mail-in ballots being sent out in some states, and the Republican nominee for president was just indicted all over again for trying to steal the last election. Earlier today, special counsel Jack Smith unveiled a new superseding indictment of Donald Trump, a brand new grand jury of Americans impaneled to hear the case against the ex-president for the first time. And once again, a grand jury of Americans came to the conclusion that criminal charges should be brought. The four charges against Trump remain unaltered from when the DOJ first brought them a year ago this month. But the reason we have a new indictment is because special counsel Jack Smith's office clearly took efforts to comply with the broad new rules of presidential immunity that the Supreme Court evented in its ruling last month. Namely, that the chief executive can effectively act with total impunity when it comes to so-called official acts. For instance, by noting that Trump's co-conspirators were not government officials and that they were acting in, quote, a private capacity when they attempted to subvert a free and fair election. Smith's indictment also highlights the fact that Trump's infamous January 6th rally at the Ellipse in Washington, where he incited the violent mob to storm the Capitol, was, quote, a campaign speech at a privately funded, privately organized political rally rather than an official act of the president of the United States. In other words, Trump may still have been president at the time, but he was not acting as the president when he attempted a coup. Now, this latest filing is obviously an attempt by Smith to get ahead of any attempts by Trump to have the case dismissed, which actually happened in another case last month when Trump appointed Judge Eileen Cannon dismissed Smith's classified documents case against Trump, a decision that Smith's office is now appealing. And, of course, none of this would be necessary in the first place if Chief Justice John Roberts and his MAGA majority on the Supreme Court did not invent a brand new standard for presidential immunity with no actual basis in constitutional law in the first place. In a clip of a new interview t released today, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, who dissented in that immunity case, shared her concerns with that decision. In your dissent, you wrote that the court declared for the first time in history that the most powerful official in the United States can, under circumstances yet to be fully determined, become a law unto himself. It sounds like a warning. Well, I mean, that was my view of what the court determined. You were concerned about broad immunity. I was concerned about uh, a system that appeared to provide immunity for one individual under one set of circumstances. When we have a criminal justice system that had ordinarily treated everyone the same. Now, to be clear, Donald Trump will not face trial in this D.C. election interference case, or in any case, for that matter, before November's election. And, of course, he's running. He's running to get the entire thing thrown out, should he win. Barbara McQuaid served as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. She's now a professor of law at the University of Michigan. Glenn Kirshner is a former federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. They both join me now. Couldn't think of better folks, Barb McQuaid, Glenn Kirshner, for joining me tonight to get us started. I don't know about you, Barb. I'm going to start with you. Did you expect a superseding indictment from Jack Smith at this time? No, I really didn't, Katie, because what I thought he would do is just pare down the indictment, filing an amended indictment to comply with the court's order. You know, obviously, the court had said the scheme relating to the Justice Department was official conduct and had to come out because a prosecutor can remove language from an indictment without going back to the grand jury. But if you change any of the allegations and put any new material in, you must go back to a grand jury and have them return that indictment. And so here, as you point out, they've really reframed the case, even though not much is different. Um, instead, the very first words of this are not Donald Trump was the 45th president of the United States, but it now says Donald Trump was a candidate for president in 2020. 
and it frames it in all of these instances as a candidate for office as opposed to a president engaging in official conduct. And so throughout the indictment, you will see not only the removal of some of these allegations about the Justice Department, but the addition of some language now to reframe it. Uh, in another example, Mike Pence is described um, as the vice president, but also as the president of the Senate, who has the power to certify the election. And so those kinds of things required that superseding indictment. So now that I see it, I can see why uh, it was a good move, but I did not anticipate it. And Glenn, it's not just, as Barb notes, the deletion of people and, and maybe some of the allegations. It's the beefing up of the allegations to make sure that it comports with what the United States Supreme Court was insistent had to happen after that horrific immunity ruling that we got just last month, it seems like longer than that, on July 1st. Len, let's talk a little bit of process, though, first. Um, no new arraignment for Donald Trump with the superseding indictment? He doesn't have to come back to court? There will be a new arraignment, but the reporting is that Jack Smith said they're not going to demand the defendant, Donald Trump's presence. And the judge can accept a waiver of a defendant's presence at an arraignment. You know, Donald Trump has been arraigned a number of times, and I guess he doesn't have to come to all of his arraignments. It makes some sense that you're not going to bog down Washington, D.C., just to have Donald Trump brought into federal court, arraigned in a five-minute hearing, and then on his merry way. Um, so, you know, I agree, Katie, that you called the Supreme Court absolute immunity ruling horrific. Constitutional scholars have said that the Supreme Court has um, declared parts of the Constitution unconstitutional, which is extraordinarily problematic and something that needs to be addressed. But I have to say, like Barb, I wasn't expecting a superseding indictment. But here's the brilliance of it from my perspective. First of all, Jack Smith was proactive. He adjusted. He looked at the indictment. He tried to pull out the offending language that might run afoul of the Supreme Court's absolute immunity ruling, pared it down from 45 pages to 36 pages. But what I was waiting for, and I thought it would come as a result of hearings before Judge Chutkin, I was waiting to see if Jack Smith believed that in the, the wake of the absolute immunity ruling from the Supreme Court, some of the charges would have to go away. It is his, his considered opinion now as, you know, evidenced by this superseding indictment that all four charges remain viable, provable, and he is going to try to proceed to trial on all four charges. And that's a good day for the prospect of accountability. You know, Barb, in order to get to a jury of his peers, Donald Trump will have to survive a motion to dismiss denial by Judge Chuck. And we've seen, let's be frank, guys, right? We had an original, you know, uh, version of the indictment. It survived a motion to dismiss by Donald Trump that was filed in front of Judge Chutkin. It's the same judge. That same indictment went to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, survived attack by Trump there. It was only the Supreme Court that did damage, if any, to the indictment. But what we're hearing from Glenn, maybe there wasn't any damage. But, you know, Barb, I guess one of the questions I've been asked as well from others is, why maybe no new co-defendants in this case? This was one of the only cases of indictments that Donald Trump had where he was facing the charges all by his lonesome. Yeah, and in fact, Katie, if there were to be a superseding indictment, I would have thought that would be the reason to do it. We've got those unindicted co-conspirators remaining in yeah. this indictment. Now, one has been removed. Speculation is that that person who is now out of this case was Jeffrey Clark, who was an, a Justice Department official who was— uh, uh, came very close to being the acting attorney general. He's out because all of that conduct is now official conduct. But the others remain, you know, again, speculation being that it's Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman and some of the others. Those five unindicted co-conspirators are still there. And I, I had always speculated that the reason they were not named as defendants and were simply referred to as unindicted co-conspirators was an effort to streamline the case so that perhaps it could go to trial before the election. Now that we know that that is not at all possible, it is a little curious that they still have not uh, included those and named them as defendants. I don't know the reason. Perhaps some are cooperating. Perhaps they still want to keep their focus on Donald Trump. Uh, I don't know the reason, but uh, I, I don't. The, the, the prior reason to streamline the case and get it on the calendar quickly no longer seems to be what's driving it. Glenn, let's talk next 
steps in the process. A lot of us were waiting for a mini trial, an evidentiary hearing or hearings of sorts to be ordered by Judge Chutkin in advance of any type of motion practice. But can we reasonably anticipate then Donald Trump filing a motion to dismiss this version, this superseding indictment? But can we also then expect once that motion to dismiss is denied that those evidentiaries could still take place? You know, they could. I think Donald Smith, uh, Do Donald Trump motions to dismiss will come early and often, and they will be yep. rejected by the judge one after another. I do think we're going to see some kind of a hearing, whether it's an evidentiary hearing where you have some of the many Republican witnesses who testified before the grand jury about Donald Trump's crimes, whether they take the stand in a public courtroom or it's done by proffer, where the parties just offer, well, Judge, this is what the evidence is, and here's why we think it survives, or Trump's lawyers will say it does not survive the Supreme Court immunity ruling. One way or another, we're going to see those hearings conducted, and we're probably going to learn more about some of the evidence that was presented to the grand jury that led to, you know, regular citizens sitting as the conscience of the community in the grand jury, indicting Donald Trump not only the first time, but a brand new grand jury doing it again a second time and issuing this superseding indictment.